Good evening. I am Brenda Jeffs, Director of Municipal Law Enforcement and Licensing Services with the City of Oshawa. Welcome to the Coexisting with Coyotes information session. Thank you for joining us. We see that we have a number of residents joining us by calling in or via computer or the mobile app. Please note that if you are joining us via computer or app, you will see your name on the screen along with the names of the panelists and presenters. There are others online, but for privacy, you will only see uh, our names and yours. The topic of tonight's information session is coexisting with coyotes. Joining us is Tracy Adams, the Commissioner of Corporate Services. This evening, you will hear from Leslie Sampson from Coyote Watch Canada, who will start us off with a brief overview and an education session on coexisting with coyotes. Then we will hear from Eva Bobak from the Ministry of Northern Development development, mines, natural resources and forestry, and finally from Kevin Fagan, the manager of municipal law enforcement with the City of Oshawa. Following the presentations, the panelists will answer your coyote related questions. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the City of Oshawa is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and is the present day home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. Today, we acknowledge that we are gathering on land covered under the Williams Treaties and the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. I would now like to turn it over to Leslie Sampson, the founding executive director of Coyote Watch Canada. Thank you so much, Brenda. Welcome, everyone. It's so great to have you here tonight. I'll be covering, as Brenda said, some overview about uh, Eastern Coyote behavior, family life, and of course, how we can best coexist with these um, incredibly challenging but uh, fascinating canids. Thank you, first slide. A little bit about us. We are an all volunteer community-based wildlife organization, and we work towards advocating positive human and wildlife experiences. We have a very unique and well-seasoned science advisory board members that are accessible to all of our municipal partners. We also collaborate with other biologists, our ministry, rehabilitators. We also provide field trained canine response teams that include community outreach, but also um, working directly with uh, citizens like yourself. And uh, lastly, we do provide obviously public education presentations as well. Next slide, please. And so how do we do our canine response team? We mobilize ground level response. We complement uh, law enforcement officers on the road, also uh, SPCAs and other agencies within the government. And we have trained canine response team personnel that work not only in the field to help uh, use non-lethal mitigation methodologies to work with different canid families, fox and coyotes and wolves. Thank you, next slide. And so we base our uh, work, our municipal wildlife strategy framework on four cornerstones that include investigation, education, enforcement and prevention. And we look to the coyote as that eco thermometer that helps us uh, uh, assess and evaluate what different uh, issues are happening within a community. And so the enforcement aspect, of course, we partner with the experts that are in the community. For example, uh, the officers that would be responding, uh, for example, in, for the city of Oshawa. Thank you, next slide. And so oftentimes we're, we come together uh, with different beliefs and perceptions and experiences. But one thing is for sure that the coyote that lives in the wilds of our minds is not the coyote that roams North America. Our misplaced fear, embroidery, indifference and imaginings is the most perilous presence out there. And hopefully tonight you'll take home some good messages and good strategies to help wildlife proof and protect your pets and also enjoy the wildlife in your beautiful community. Next slide, please. And so perception is everything with these animals, um, especially understanding who they are, what drives the behavior, their seasonal milestones, 
and facts are always always more empowering than um, fiction. And so fostering and practicing respectful, safe, appropriate human behavior and boundaries really creates a great uh, community that can coexist with the Eastern Coyote. And considering being a champion for the community, you can do neighborhood watches. There's lots of opportunity to contribute towards the, the overall program within the city of Oshawa. Thank you, next slide. And so just remember when you're looking at social media, uh, it is a great tool for sharing information. However, oftentimes, especially with um, media outlets, there isn't investigative reporting that's done. And so you have to really uh, use rigorous scrutiny when you're consuming information that, that's provided through social media forums. And also just you know keeping in mind that oftentimes uh, a photograph is just that, a photograph, and it doesn't give a lot of details or nuance to a situation. Next slide, please. And so this is uh, a coyote from uh, close to Oshawa, not right beside Oshawa, but this coyote was fed often by a gentleman for about a year. And you can see that uh, her teeth are rotted in the front and she is an Eastern coyote. And so that photo, she was actually yawning, but this is the kind of photo that would be used on social media to portray these animals as being uh, very, you know, vicious and um, wanting to go after people and animals. And so we do um, ask that you head to our website as well to look at our resources at coyotewatchcanada.com, in particular, looking at the Mythbusters. Thank you. Next slide. And so looking at who Eastern Coyote is within our ecosystems, um, the species provides a lot of ecological and social benefits. As you know, social media, there's photographs of these animals and on every um, neighborhood app, on next door apps, and they are the subject of research and admiration by different cultures and in, in, within our communities. They provide an ecological niche. They consume copious amounts of small mammals, mainly the rodent voles and mice and they also, those species harbor zoonotic diseases. So the coyote is actually, along with the fox, helping with that role. And also um, for ecotourism as well. And so, you know, with, whether it's art shows or music or having uh, poetry readings, there's a lot of exciting events that can take place that surround this animal within the community and especially within the schools. Next slide, please. And so why do communities reach a point where there's conflict? So oftentimes uh, we're not looking at the feeding connection and folks believe that they're doing something good, but they're actually setting up these animals and other wildlife for failure. And if there's a lack of enforcement for existing bylaws, that can also play a part as well. Unkept bird feeders underneath, that attracts all those small animals that birds of prey and canids like fox and coyotes rely on as food sources. And you can be directly feeding or indirectly feeding birds and squirrels on a trail system or in a park, that all contributes to um, food conditioning a coyote to come around. And so looking at hot spots within the community, cemeteries, um, construction sites, parking lots, trail systems, golf courses, all of these areas end up being hot spots when people are providing food. And so we need everyone to buy into a coexistence program to help uh, establish and create healthy and safe boundaries. Next slide, please. And so what we do is we actually look, and I know that the city of Oshawa applies this type of uh, information model as well. We look at sighting reports. The one thing you have to remember, though, is when you do report a sighting, it goes, it's plotted, but there's also multiple people seeing the same coyote. So we look at maps to see where there's hot, potential hotspots or where there's a new coyote family that might be establishing in an area. So it's great for public education and where to put signage up. But always remembering that 
um, the plots on a map don't mean that those are all different coyotes. Thank you, next slide. And so just to get a little bit into the scientific background of the Eastern Coyote. So our Eastern Coyotes have been established here for over a century now. They are mainly Western Coyote. There is some insignificant um, Algonquin wolf DNA that is, uh, makes up part of who these animals are. And also depending on where the DNA samples are taken, there could be a remnant old dog DNA. It doesn't mean that they're running around mating with domestic dogs or vice versa. And so we are looking at this species as already being, uh, you know, if you go back geological time frame, we're talking Pleistocene era. So the Canis latrans is the subspecies of Canis. And so we do not refer to them as koi wolf. That's a nickname. They are the Eastern coyote and they're recognized by our ministry as that as well. So we don't have koi wolves and coyotes, we just have straight up Eastern coyotes. And they are all part of the same family as our domestic dog, wolves, jackals, and fox as well. Thank you, next slide. And so just look at this info infographic for a second and look at the size variation. And so Eastern coyotes, although they look very large, their, their hair adds significant illusion that they do uh, weigh a lot. They're roughly on average 35 to 38 pounds. There's the odd anomaly that might weigh more and some that weigh less. So they will be full grown by the first year of life. And uh, when you see an Eastern coyote and they're running or walking, their tails will be down. And they have usually a black tip, whereas a fox's tail has a white tip and they are somewhat parallel to the ground. Thank you, next slide. One thing that is so significant about this canid species is that they are monogamous. They mate for life when left to thrive. So you have a mom and dad in a family they're all related in a particular territory or home range. And so it's only the mom and dad that, that breed. And so they would have probably just come out of their mating season right now. It's usually around mid-February. And so if one or both parents uh, perish, then that territory would become available for another coyote or two to move into there. Thank you. Next slide. And so if you look at the, um, the mouth of the den, that is a, a typical natural den for an Eastern coyote. You can see the, um, the head of the female in that den opening. And so there's biological, ecological, and developmental milestones that it's really important that um, citizens understand what they are. And then they'll have a better understanding about why they're seeing certain behaviors around certain times of year. And so um, Eastern coyotes could mate within the first year of life, but oftentimes the research is um, suggesting that it's two to three years. The gestation for the female is 60 to 63 days, and uh, coyotes might choose uh, a, to make a den under uh, amounts of earth, as, as you can see in the photo under outbuildings, and that's why it's so important to make sure that you're sealing them up. Also excavating um, tree roots and using an old den from a groundhog, for example. Sometimes they have a backup den. Oftentimes we're finding that in urban scapes, it's a little bit more difficult because uh, the real estate is tough to come by. And so that's why, again, seal up under those outbuildings. And they're active all year round. Um, there's a misconception that coyotes are only active during this time of year. They have to feed themselves and in the spring, summer, fall, they're feeding their young ones. So they're active. Sometimes you might see them out in the daytime as well. That is nothing to be alarmed about unless they're visiting the same place and getting a food reward. And so on average, they have two to five pups and that will depend on the food resources, the availability in their territory. Next slide, please. And so pups in the den, the um, bottom photo that you see, those are all Eastern Coyote pups and the eyes are closed and the ears are down. So they are completely vulnerable and dependent on mum only for the nourishment of milk. Dad will bring mum food into the den. 
And so completely vulnerable. And at that point, um, they'll be weaned at about five to six weeks and they start to consume semi-solid foods. It's regurgitated from mom and dad. So the pups elicit that behavior by licking or uh, nibbling at the mouth of mom or dad. And so the photo at the top, you can just start to see the ears are starting to become erect, but the eyes are already open. Again, they're vulnerable to dog predation, birds of prey predation as well. Thank you, next slide. And so we often um, have areas where there might be a um, higher incident of encounters. And these are what we call rendezvous sites or safe zones. And so mom and dad decide on a location. Once the pups are weaned, they leave the den. They only use that den during um, the pup rearing time. Then they relocate to a rendezvous site. And so again, the pups would be vulnerable to dogs off leash and mom and dad would be very defensive as well. And plus, uh, humans actually like to take young animals and the rehabilitators that we work with see often um, there's cases where domestic dogs have uh, attacked or even killed coyotes as well. Um, but you can also reach out to us if you ever have a situation where a fox or a coyote is in need. And so these areas, it's critical to make sure that you're venturing there with your dog on a leash. Next slide, please. And so they are what we consider adaptive omnivores. And what that basically means is they have such a wide, diverse um, choices in their diet. And depending on the time of year, the geographic location, and the abundance of prey, their diet could shift and it could go with the seasons as well. They are absolutely amazing foragers and hunters. They're creative. They do not need any human handouts. And probably about roughly 60 to 80%, again, depending on the time of year, um, it consists of rodents and small mammals, but they do utilize vegetation, carrion, and carrion is just a fancy word for animals that have already been died, or dead, pardon me. Um, they're uh, in the landscape, either on the highway or in a field, a uh, deer could be hit by a vehicle, and of course, coyotes would utilize that. And we look at this species as a keystone facilitator for healthy ecosystems. And their excellent sense of smell, hearing, and memory. And that's why it's really important not to start food conditioning these animals. They don't need our help. Thank you. Next slide. And so this is just um, a graph that demonstrates some of the food choices that uh, these particular coyotes, they're Western coyotes. And this was a study done by one of our science advisory board members, Dr. Shelley Alexander and Dr. Lukasik. And um, just something to note, their diet varies. And again, um, it's going to depend on the geographic location. And so if you note, the significance of the small mammals and vegetation. And there's 484 scat analyses and uh, less than 1.24% uh, was indicating that there would be any kind of domestic animal. And that did not distinguish between an, uh, an animal that had already died or it was consumed. So their diet will vary. You could look at other um, scat analysis studies and they would show um, different dietary composition in those scats. Thank you. Next slide. And as I mentioned, they are great at cleaning up the environment. They're in Mother Nature's cleanup crew. That is a deer that was hit by a train. And that particular coyote and his family uh, consumed that deer in about three days. And if you can note the ear separation there, that's a sign of a coyote that's not sure if they should be staying or leaving. Thank you. Uh, next slide. And so when it comes to coyote vocalizations, coyotes communicate in a variety of ways. They don't have a cell phone, so they have to utilize their um, canid oral cues, which is their vocalizations. They can have high pitch si um, yips and uh, they will respond to high-pitched sirens, trains, and music. They will bark and yip and howl. 
And oftentimes folks hear that and they think that, oh my gosh, they've just killed something. And no, that's not the case at all. They're communicating to their own relatives or to transient coyotes that are non-related that might be coming into their territory. And that's their way of warning about danger or a threat. And they will do howling and barking if a dog comes into the area where a den is. One phenomena that is interesting to note, it's called the bow jest effect. And there's been some compelling studies. Oftentimes, uh, listeners will over, um, over guess the number of coyotes, overestimate. So usually two or three can sound like five or six. And so that's that auditory illusion. Thank you so much. Next slide. And so they are amazing at navigating in cities. So right across North America, coyotes have established themselves. And so when we look at how they navigate through our communities, sometimes infrastructure change, culverts, fencing going up can influence where and how they navigate. And so typically they would use travel corridors like railway beds, hydro corridors, shorelines, trail systems that you and I might walk on, old roadways. Uh, but one thing is for sure, if there's infrastructure changes, you might have had a coyote family living near you, but all of a sudden you're seeing them more often. And that could be because of fencing. And they teach those skills to their young as well. And so it's really important to understand if there's an increase in sighting, is it because of infrastructure change or there's been habitat loss or is it because of a food source? Next slide, please. And they are extremely well adapted at connecting small pockets of green space in our urban, our urban landscapes. And so they can connect one pocket to the next. And so they could be finding food um, their natural food sources in these areas, or they might be getting food resources from a person in the community. And so the size of their territory, again, is influenced by food, shelter, and water. And so it's critical if you're in a community and there's coyote sightings that you're ensuring that you're wildlife proofing your home. If they're passing through, that's one thing, but we don't want them to overstay their welcome. Next slide, please. And so some of the environmental impacts on coyote wellness and survival. So injury and illness, they're susceptible. They don't see a vet like our domestic dogs. So they're susceptible to all the same things that our domestic dogs are. Vehicle trauma is one of the leading causes of mortality and human caused injuries as well um, in city urban scapes. Sarcoptic mange which the test for that is a deep skin scraping. A lot of um, community members uh, make the assumption that because a coyote or fox has hair loss that it's automatically sarcoptic mange. And there's a lot of other conditions, poisoning um, from consuming toxins or rodenticide from uh, mice or rats being poisoned that can impact their immune system. And so if one or both pups uh, perish, for a variety of dangers that they experience on their in their daily lives, then the pups are orphaned. And so um, oftentimes too, if they're forced to disperse from their home range, that can add um, a level of danger and also impacting residents in an area that they might not have had coyotes there before. Thank you, next slide. And so, when you look at why am I seeing coyotes in, the, in my neighborhood now, what's happening? So you've got to connect those feeding um, attractions. So, you know, coyotes are maintaining that home range, but if they're getting fed at one or two locations, they're actually not then utilizing their entire habitat. And so it's, it's essential that you do your inventory on your own property to make sure that there are not any attractants being provided. And so, you know, once coyotes are exposed to human food, they become food conditioned and we have to then do intervention first removing the food. 
And so direct or indirect feeding, again, it could be in your backyard. You might not even know you're doing that. You're open compost. You're throwing out, you know, bread and uh, food items for other animals. Again, we don't want to see that. Um, but it's garbage handling, compost handling, and making sure that you pick up, you know, fruit that's fallen under a tree. But public education is key. Next slide, please. And so I'm probably going to say this 50 times in my presentation about the harmful handout. And this is an example at a cemetery of people consistently feeding very young coyotes. And so um, a couple of things that happen here. Once we start feeding any wildlife, you can look at the bird feeder, you can look at squirrels that are on a trail system, um, little uh, birds. So what it does is it actually increases wildlife proximity tolerance to people to backyards if that's where the food source is coming from or public spaces human food is not healthy for wildlife and um, especially for canids like fox and coyotes they need to eat their natural diet to stay healthy and so there all this rotten food dog food that people put out there it's nutritionally it, it's void of any goodness for these animals so um, and chronic feeding also encourages an unnatural congregation of prey species as well so you can actually have an uptick in uh, rats and mice and so we don't want to see that either next slide please and so recognizing and preventing encounters and conflict, if you know that somebody's feeding, reach out to the city, communicate that. And it's an education process. Some folks don't realize the connection of feeding, especially coyotes and fox, and what that can do to other folks that then venture into that area when they're recreating. And so I mentioned about sealing up under buildings outside and um, maintaining vacant properties that can also be a, an attractant for rodents, which will then attract birds of prey and also um, fox and coyotes. And ensuring that, you know, golf course uh, attendees are not providing foods as well. And so those hot spots then become areas where dog and coyote encounters can increase as well. And so dogs are considered a predator to a coyote. And so they're looking at them as competition for food resource, as a danger and a risk. And so when your dog is off leash, you're exposing your dog to a wide variety of dangers, but also there could be an encounter. In one study, um, Dr. Alexander demonstrated that 92.3% um, of encounters between uh, domestic dogs and uh, coyotes were because the, the um, dog was off leash. So it's preventable for these um, really high, highly volatile encounters. Next slide, please. And so if you're looking at your backyard, how do you wildlife proof it? You have to understand that fox and coyotes and other animals like raccoons can climb over a fence or dig under. Your dog can also climb fences and dig under. And so it's really important to attend um, in the backyard, especially for the smaller species of dogs. Um, and there's countless risks and dangers for our pets besides wildlife. If they get out, they can be hit by a car or become lost. And so it's really important to do that inventory and make sure you're not throwing all of your um, foliage and your cleanups in the fall over a fence because that adds, that becomes like a bridge for animals to climb up and get over. Next slide, please. And so coyote sightings increase and at residents are alarmed and that's natural. But one thing is for sure, if coyotes are venturing into your backyard, someone in the area is providing food, whether it's direct or indirectly. Next slide, please. And so if you look at this case study, um, this was an investigated hotspot that our canine response team visited and there was um, countless amounts of food on a daily basis and it was only one household on a street of 14 houses and um, this coyote came on a daily basis to get the food and it was not great food as you can see there's bread items and different things there and so once the food was removed 
uh, the coyote stop visiting that backyard and it is that simple. Thank you, next slide. And so this, uh, this photo actually was used for um, signage for the city of Toronto. They absolutely can provide for their families and they do not need our help. And again, the nutritionally poor food that um, wildlife eats, it can impact their immune system quickly. Thank you, next slide. And so we're gonna get into some best practices. How can you deter a coyote from an area or from your backyard, or if you encounter a coyote when you're recreating out in the community? And that is Dr. Lauren Van Patter demonstrating the green garbage bag method. That method is used and deployed by law enforcement, first response officers across Ontario. It is a method that works and it's safe and it's non-lethal. And it's a great way to establish respectful and safe boundaries between people and wildlife. Thank you. Next slide. And if you want to learn more about um, the research that we did with Dr. Lauren Van Patter, um, you can reach out to me afterwards and get a copy of our paper, but it goes into advancing best practices for aversion conditioning and humane hazing. And it's a method to use, use to mitigate human and, uh, human and um, coyote conflict in urban areas. Thank you, next slide. And so we talk about aversion conditioning or humane hazing. You've probably heard the term hazing. And what is it? It's an action that encourages a coyote or fox to retreat or deters them from coming into an area. It has to be delivered from the person. So you're not standing inside your house and waving your arms or banging pots together. They have to be able to see you. You're not in your vehicle delivering these um, methods. You have to be out in, in the community. And it can be a very, very, um, you know, a little bit disconcerting for folks that haven't done this before. Um, but people do it when they're recreating in areas where there's bears. There's also other animals that um, we are in the environment with up north and out west. We need to learn how to um, deter these animals from our presence. And so th these are assertive responses put into action, and it could be voice very um, assertive, get out of here, you're not screaming, you're yelling using an assertive voice and also body gesturing, being very um, assertive, stamping your feet, waving your hands, clapping, but the message has to be confident, clear and concise. And making sure also that aversion conditioning is partnered with direct uh, attractant removal to ensure that the reshaping of the behavior will continue. Next slide, please. And so more about aversion conditioning. So it's really important. These are um, techniques that are lifelong tools. And if you're, um, you know, oftentimes out in trail systems, it's really great. You can bring that green garbage bag with you and deploy that as well. Human indifference isn't a good response. If you know that people are feeding or you come across an area when you're out recreating and there's a pile of food there or the garbage bins are overflowing, absolutely pick up the phone and call the city so they can address those issues. And there is a feeding wildlife bylaw for the city of Oshawa, so um, folks need to keep that in mind as well. And so it's a negative association and it helps these animals understand where their boundaries are. We are the ones that set the boundaries for them. They're not setting them for us. Next slide, please. And so when you provide food for uh, especially an animal that's so intelligent like a coyote, um, they're again related to our family dog from the same canid family. And probably some of us have dogs at home that can start, you know, presenting demand behavior and essentially begging. And so what happens is, again, that proximity tolerance to people, they might, uh, their wariness of us diminishes. This does not mean that they're not fearful because if aversion conditioning is successful, um, we make that misconception that coyotes are not afraid of us. They're willing to take the chance 
of coming closer to us for that food reward. That's how strong food drives behavior. And so you might see a coyote nipping at a knapsack. Um, food conditioned coyotes will take um, risks and come closer to people. They might approach a picnic table where they've received food rewards before. As soon as those food rewards are removed and aversion condition, conditioning is deployed, we see a marked increase um, in appropriate behavior for sure. And so we just don't want to have that kind of behavior with our wild canids in the community. Next slide, please. And so some of these methods, you can see uh, Officer Lamb from the City of Toronto demonstrating for uh, residents at an outdoor education session. And she's um, showing uh, this, these particular residents how to do that method. But you're, again, your voice, waving your arms. You can use whistle or horns. But again, you know, urban coyotes along with all of our other wildlife species, hear sounds on a daily basis. They hear people laughing, fighting, yelling, music, uh, horns honking, whistles blowing near soccer fields. They hear construction. They become acclimatized to those that, that stimulus. And so they're not necessarily going to react to that. So you want to make sure that you're considering different methods. They don't ever have green garbage be bags being snapped at them or umbrellas popping or shake hands being thrown towards them. And just remember, you never turn your back and run from any um, a dog or a wild canid. And if you have a small dog or a child, you can pick them up and just never turn your back. So deploying these methods, it, it really does build um, healthy uh, boundaries with these animals. Next slide, please. And so one thing I will note is that you should never be doing any kind of approaching or harassing of a coyote that's near the den or has pups out in the community. So that means you're leashing up your dog right away. You're not allowing your dog to approach the den site. Um, these are seasonal milestones where parents are extremely protective of their young ones. And so respecting that can minimize negative encounters between a dog and a coyote family for sure. And so it's important, again, if you see food resources out in the community, report those sightings right away so the, um, the city of Oshawa can address them for sure. Next slide, please. And so looking at people and dogs, this is um, where the most, um, I would say, uh, emotional, um, highly, highly discussed encounters are between, you know, people with their dogs and coyotes. In the upper photo, as you can see, we hear about coyotes that are attacking dogs or having encounters with dogs but what we don't hear in the media is the countless times that dogs have hightailed it and chased after coyotes and so the other thing to bear in mind as well our dogs again come home and eat their three squares a day in our in our homes but with domestic dogs um, they also have the care of us coyotes are using uh, resources to find food when they're fleeing from dogs, they're, they don't have spare energy. So it's it really critical to remember that this is where they live out in green spaces. And we don't want our dogs to engage with wildlife on any level, whether it's a deer, or coyote, or fox, or birds on the ground that are nesting. When there's pups in an area, a coyote might follow. We call that shadowing or escorting um, a dog walker out. Again, you don't want to turn your back and run. You use that assertiveness, keep your dog close to you. And again, consider, is this pup and denning time? Now, if a coyote is shadowing you and you're walking out and you're still feeling uncomfortable, make sure that you keep your, you know, you're facing that coyote and using your voice and carry that green garbage bag in your back pocket. And please don't have your earbuds in and be on your cell phone because in greenscapes, you never know when you're going to encounter, um, whether it's a coyote, fox, deer, or raccoon, those are ways to avoid um, those negative encounters and to protect your dog. 
as well. And I mentioned about the dog and coyote encounters. I already covered that. Next slide, please. And so when we look at coyote vocalizations, and coyotes leave scat, that's a fancy name for poo, and they also urinate, and they leave, they rub their um, glands against posts and um, different areas, and so do our domestic dogs. They're leaving their messaging, their uh, sensory messaging all over the place as well. So coyotes communicate if a person has ever seen this, I'm not sure, maybe somebody in the audience has, um, during pup rearing time, it's extremely stressful for canids. They're protective and defensive. And again, a dog is like a predator. So um, sometimes there's a history between a dog chasing a particular coyote. And so that's exacerbated when it's um, pup rearing time or if there's feeding reports and there's a dog and coyote encounter. So it's important to look at those considerations. But if a coyote starts to howl or bark or jump up and down or bluff charge, that's an indication that there are most likely pups there if it's during um, May, June, all the way till um, early fall. Uh, coyotes will also guard a food resource. Let's say they just happen to kill a squirrel or a rabbit and a dog comes near that food resource. They're going to defend that as well. And so they're trying their, their darndest to communicate to us, but sometimes um, we don't understand what they are trying to do. And so if you're walking your dog and you notice that you can see these behaviors being exhibited, just bear in mind those seasonal milestones. What do you think is happening? You can uh, pull your dog close to you on the leash and slowly but calmly leave the area. And also re report those encounters as well so the city can be aware of what's happening. And the thing is too, um, folks that leave food out for coyotes, they might enjoy seeing them. And the next person that comes along that has a dog on a leash there might be an encounter there. And that person has no idea that the people before them have left food out. So it's always to be a good neighbor and to be a good citizen, just don't leave the food out for these animals. Next slide, please. And so when we look at um, creating uh, coexistence programs and wildlife resilient communities, there's excellent programs all throughout Ontario, City of Oshawa, um, amazing uh, outreach available and education on the website and also um, the coyote strategy framework as well that's been developed but one thing is for sure it takes an entire community to create a successful coexistence program and we have responsibilities as citizens and neighbors and so uh, recognizing how you can change um, what you're doing, something subtle, a small step in the right direction, and always communicating if you are seeing feeding or if there's dogs off leash in a park that's supposed to be leash. Help the city out, help your community out, and um, make those reports. And um, again, if you have any questions that we don't address tonight, you can reach us at uh, coyotewatchcanada.com. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to thank everybody for listening tonight. And I hope you are able to take away some great tips and strategies and maybe practice uh, that aversion conditioning at home uh, before you actually venture out into the community. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leslie. That's a lot of really great information. I, I think I learn something new every time I speak with you. Uh, a reminder for those who are joining us uh, this evening via computer or app, you will see your name on the screen along with the names of the panelists and presenters. Following the presentations, there will be a question and answer portion where we, we, we will be answering your coyote related questions. If you are joining us this evening by computer or, mo or mobile app, you will be able to submit your questions using the chat feature after the presentations. And to those who submitted questions in advance, we will also be answering those questions after the presentations.
I would now like to turn it over to Eva Bobak, who is a resource specialist from the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Brenda, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining um, us tonight. Um, so tonight, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the protection of property provisions under the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act, and a little bit about uh, MNR's role uh, with respect to coyote conflicts. Right. So the provincial legislation is the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act. Uh, the Act provides a legal basis for uh, acting in defense of property. So it provides for harassment, capture, or killing of wildlife, causing or about to cause damage, using specific methods, um, allowing the use of agents to act on a property owner's behalf, um, setting limits on relocation um, of wildlife causing damage. Um, if wildlife is live trapped under protection of property, the law allows that wildlife to be relocated within one kilometer of point of capture in, in similar habitat. Um, the regulations, <clears throat> excuse me, define the tools that can be used to address the conflict. So methods to protect your property, um, regulations around hunting and trapping. So municipal bylaws may impact on the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act, meaning that <clears throat> The Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act provincial legislation does not supersede municipal bylaws when it comes to firearm discharge or use of body gripping traps. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> so some other jurisdictions across Canada, um, wildlife ownership has been vested to the Crown under legislation. In some of these cases, the legislation also exempts the Crown from any legal liability or compensation associated with personal injury, uh, property damage, or death caused by wildlife. So in Ontario, the, the provincial legislation does not give the Crown ownership of wildlife, but it only allows the Ministry to manage <clears throat> wildlife. So the Ministry does so by regulating the activities of people as they affect wildlife. So we, we set um, hunting seasons and limits, and there's also regulations around possession, buying, and selling of wildlife. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what can the public do? Um, so the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act does provide provisions to landowners to protect their property if they believe on reasonable grounds that wildlife is damaging or is about to damage their property. If this is the case, a person can capture, kill, or harass the wildlife on their own property. Um, a person can also contract an agent to do th these things on their behalf. So the following classes of agents listed um, on the slide are agents that are pre-authorized under the regulations. Next slide, please. What you can't do. <clears throat> so no person is permitted to possess or use a body, body gripping trap unless they hold a valid trapping license or they are a farmer or member of the farmer's immediate family. Also, any body gripping traps can only be used in parts of Ontario where they're permitted. And as I mentioned earlier, these traps are also subject to municipal bylaws and the use of poisons or adhesives is strictly prohibited for wildlife control. Um, these methods are non-selective um, and they, they're inhumane <clears throat> and they uh, cause a great deal of pain and suffering before the animal eventually dies. Next slide. What is our role? So we help landowners and municipalities by providing information on best practices and animal control services. Uh, we can provide agency referrals. If somebody is looking for a licensed trapper, they can contact our office. We can provide them with contact information. Um, we also have fact sheets and information on, on our website. Um, the ministry manages coyote and other wildlife populations through setting of hunting and trapping seasons and bag limits and currently in most of southern ontario there are no limits or closed seasons for coyotes and it's important to mention that the ministry does not provide direct coyote control 
Next slide, please. For more information, uh, please visit our website. It's up on the screen. And if you have any specific questions, um, I've included my uh, email on the bottom. And I thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jiva. A reminder for those who are joining us via computer or app, you will see your name on the screen along with the names of the panelists and presenters. Uh, following the presentations, there will be a Q&A portion where you will be able to submit your questions. And to those uh, who submitted questions in advance, we will answer those after the presentations as well. I would now like to turn it over to the Manager of Municipal Law Enforcement with the City of Oshawa, Kevin Fagan. Thank you, Brenda, and good evening, everyone. I appreciate this opportunity to share some information about municipal law enforcement, our roles and responsibilities, as well as our Coyote response to date, um, our Coyote response management plan, and some next steps that we plan on taking. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. With respect to animals, Municipal law enforcement's primary responsibility involves the Responsible Pet Owners Bylaw. And the city's Responsible Pet Owners Bylaw regulates the care and control of animals in the city of Oshawa. The purpose is to ensure that animals are kept and treated in a humane and responsible manner. Some of those regulations include uh, prohibited animals, um, things like lions, tigers, and bears, as well as more pertinent to coyotes. Uh, where livestock is restricted to agricultural zones rather than urban areas. Um, it restricts animals running at large. It uh, creates, um, when animals do run at large, creates conflicts. Um, and as you've heard tonight from one of the other panelists, it, it can attract and cause negative behavior uh, with coyotes when dogs and cats are allowed to run at large. We also enforce animal licensing and animal care standards which address food, shelter, and care for pets. Next slide, please. Throughout the year, the city receives calls for found domestic animals as well, and those are reported uh, through Service Oshawa. Our officers attend and scan for a uh, microchip, which is uh, about the size of a grain of rice inserted under the animal's skin and helps uh, identify the owner. Um, that's for an attempt to return uh, to the owner. We also have a free ride home program, uh, which reunites pets with the owners when we can uh, uh, match the identification. If not, the animals are transported to the animal shelter for impound and uh, further investigation. Um, when animals are impounded, they're kept for uh, a period that's prescribed under provincial law. And during that redemption period, it affords the opportunity to reunite the pet with its owner. Uh, unclaimed animals, if, if they're not uh, reunited with their owners, are put up for adoption. Next slide, please. We also deal with injured or sick wildlife. And again, those are reported uh, through Service Oshawa. Uh, our officers would attend and capture the animal if they're able to. And that's followed by an assessment by either a veterinarian or animal shelter staff to determine whether it can be rehabilitated or if euthanasia is the final outcome and staff utilize the service of wildlife custodians and rescue organizations for rehab at appropriate facilities. Next slide. In addition to our other roles, it's the task of monitoring sightings of other wildlife, and the city has seen a significant increase in sightings from previous years in 2021. Most of those reports are for information only, and the residents indicated that there was no real concern uh, with the animal, but a number expressed concern for their safety or that of children and pets. Um, there were four confirmed bites that occurred throughout 2021, and those were from three different areas, um, two being from Bridal Park, um, the other being from Northway Court Park and Oshawa Boulevard. Uh, there were also incidents involving pets as well in 2021. Next slide, please. In response to the increased sightings and concerns, the city has taken a number of actions. So real-time monitoring response with officers attending the sites, increased signage to alert residents of sightings and uh, potential risk, 
Um, we've installed fencing, uh, modified garbage cans or removed them altogether, as well as cleared brush that might be contributing to rodents or providing habitat, um, as well as uh, community education, speaking with residents, uh, distributing letters, patrols, direct contact with officers, um, meeting with businesses, and attending schools and school boards um, for both inspections and training. And with the hopes that we can minimize the human and wildlife conflict by being aware of the diversity of wildlife in our community and using preventative techniques. Next slide, please. Included in our, our public strategies to date are public communications, so communicating through social media, Twitter and Facebook, and on the City of Oshawa website. Uh, we've also consulted with other municipalities, not only in Durham region, but across Canada. Um, we've uh, conducted research, looked at uh, data from the Humane Society of the United States, and we've also looked at location and practices of local feral cat colonies and any potential impact to coyote behavior that they might have. We've also updated our tracking system, and this was in the interest to better identify the nature of the sightings or the interactions that we see. We've also worked with Durham Region Police Services um, to, to confirm their role with respect to public safety and dispatching injured animals. Next slide, please. You've heard uh, discussion about aversion conditioning and uh, when possible officers attend and conduct uh, aversion conditioning. That's utilizing the bag method that you've heard about from the other panelists this evening. We've also made updates to the nuisance bylaw to reduce the chance of people contributing to unwanted uh, coyote behavior through feeding. Um, under that bylaw, feeding wildlife is strictly prohibited whether it's directly as being intentionally or inadvertently where you may have like a bird feeder that's overflowing and attracting rodents. Uh, the bylaw provides for tiered fines, beginning at $250. Um, then for a second or subsequent offense, $350. And finally, $450 to create both a specific and general deterrent. Um, and lastly, at the direction of City Council, we created the Coyote Response Management Plan. Next slide, please. The purpose of the policy, the Coyote Response Management Plan, is to support a safe coexistence with urban coyotes using education, behavior modification, and the implementation of a tiered and escalated approach in response to human and coyote conflicts. The uh, city response options are based on the nature of the interaction, and we classify it as either sightings, encounters, incidents, and bites to either pets or persons. The response range are, are progress on a case by case basis or a location by location basis and are based on confirmation of details of the occurrence. Next slide. Um, municipal law enforcement services work collaboratively uh, with both community partners and internal departments who contribute to the role of wildlife management in the city. And those would include Coyote Watch Canada, wildlife specialists, Ministry of Natural Resources, Parks and Operations staff, property owners and tenants, corporate communications, and Service Oshawa. Next slide, please. As indicated earlier, municipal law enforcement uh, monitors encounters, incidents, bites to pets or people. And we do that in order to determine if uh, targeted communication should be distributed within a neighborhood. Um, to investigate neighborhood area for evidence of coyote attractions, uh, or attractants, sorry, such as food, shelter, and water, and address the removal of, of those attractants. We also gather information, um, including uh, descriptions of the coyote, asking a variety of questions, of witnesses, uh, as recommended by Coyote Watch Canada, and we patrol for violations of the bylaws that may be contributing to the behavior and issue fines as appropriate. Some of those bylaws include lot maintenance, property standards, the responsible pet owners bylaw. Next slide, please. Depending on the nature of the interaction, the city could take a number of uh, actions similar to what we've already discussed, but could include so education and communications, changes to physical space, aversion conditioning, uh, engaging our community partners, and humane elimination as a last resort. 
Um, certainly the capture or humane removal of a coyote would only occur as last resort. And that would be in the event of a confirmed bite to a person or if a coyote has been determined to be sick or injured and can't be re rehabilitated. Um, as a last option, when all other response options and measures have failed, that's been determined that there is a threat to public safety. Um, the removal obviously would attempt to focus on the individual problematic coyote. And, and we'd gather that information based on descriptions and evidence, um, even using trail cameras where appropriate. We, we'd require significant investigation or efforts to attempt to ensure that the correct animal is removed. And it'd only be carried out by a qualified and licensed agent hired by city staff. Next slide, please. In terms of next steps, we want to ensure that our communications are both timely and seasonable. So from January and February, uh, which is the mating period time, and uh, we'd want to inform the public about that, as well as March through June, uh, when den selection is uh, happening and pup rearing, and in September and October, when we have the dispersal of some of the pack members and sightings may increase due to that. Next slide, please. Um, Municipal law enforcement will continue to look for opportunities to collaborate with uh, the Minister of Natural Resources uh, on potential opportunities to further their research as well. And I'm excited to report uh, uh, to complement both our resources and foster collaboration with our local uh, educational institutions, um, a, a program with Durham College. So students of their animal care program will be assisting municipal law enforcement staff to deliver public communication, real-time monitoring and aversion conditioning. Next slide, please. The uh, Coyote Response uh, Management Plan and a variety of tools and resources can be found at our website. That's the www.oshawa.ca coyotes. And as well, we encourage people to report sightings through Service Oshawa. Um, the 436-3311, as well as service at oshawa.ca and our website. And that concludes my presentation, and I uh, appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much, Kevin. We are now in the question and answer portion of the session. Uh, please submit your questions to the Q&A moderator in the chat window. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, bear with us as we read through them. A few reminders on how to submit questions. If you're here on a computer, you will see the chat on the right-hand side of your screen. Type your question in the chat box and choose to submit to the Q&A moderator. If you're here through the mobile app, click the participants icon at the top right of your screen and a menu should slide open. Click Q&A moderator and type your question in the chat box and submit. Okay, I'm going to read through some questions and I will uh, refer them to the appropriate presenter. So our first question is, have you considered fencing off open fields or putting extra lights in parks to prevent coyotes from using and increase safety? And I would ask Kevin to respond, please. Thank you. Um, yes, the city has considered fencing where appropriate, and we certainly continue to do so. Um, that fencing really isn't a barrier, as you've uh, heard tonight, in terms of uh, preventing the coyote from entering an area. It may discourage to some degree, but primarily to create a, a barrier more so for the public and to alert them to an area where we would. Uh, avoid entry uh, in contact with coyotes in those areas. As well, uh, community services would consider requests for additional lighting on a case-by-case -case basis. Our next request is to put up signage in public spaces for coyote warnings and what to do if you encounter a coyote. And maybe Kevin could respond to that as well. Um, yeah, certainly the city has installed additional signage in areas 
And those are areas where there's been significant sightings, uh, again, to alert the public. And um, if, um, if the noise that, that you create um, or appearing larger doesn't intimidate a coyote, um, certainly following the steps that we recommend um, and available on our city website. If you feel there's an imminent threat, though, to your safety, you should contact 911. Our next question, why can't nonviolent coyotes be relocated and the aggressive ones be dealt with to prevent attacks and bring back balance in the ecosystem? And I think I'd like to ask Leslie from CWC to respond. Leslie, are you with us still and able to respond to that question? Oh, sorry about that. Yes, great question. Thank you so much. Uh, we often get that, and um, there's a couple of um, key things to consider. As I mentioned during my presentation, uh, coyote families maintain a home range. They have a set territory, and they stay within that territory. So um, to remove one or two coyotes out of an area, um, it would not be uh, humane, number one. Number two, they would find their way back. Um, there's also uh, regulations, which my colleague Eva would be able to address as well, but um, we're, we are um, restricted to ever do that. And as far as removing uh, coyotes that have exhibited behavior that's inappropriate, um, whether it's, you know, encounters with dogs or there have been bite incidents, again, as um, Kevin mentioned from the city, um, those situations require investigation and identification of that coyote that has, um, you know, bitten somebody. And so uh, the, the big thing here is for community members is to know that through um, direct action, you can prevent these incidents if you know that people are feeding. There's times where there's been encounters where uh, somebody has been bitten and that individual was not providing food, but other people were before that. And so just keeping, keeping that in mind, um, it's not as easy to uh, you know disrupt an ecosystem. And the balance can be found and the harmony can be found again as long as people are not feeding these animals. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And I wonder, Eva, could you comment on uh, and just explain again our restrictions to relocating animals? Uh, sure. Thanks, Brenda. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the legislation um, does not allow the uh, relocation of wildlife more than a kilometer from point of capture. And the reason for this um, is essentially to prevent the spread of any diseases or parasites to other populations, um, to give the animal its best chance of survival by ensuring that it's released close to its original home range, to reduce the potential for problem activity in other areas, to prevent the exchange of genetic material among different populations of wildlife in different areas, and also to ensure that the carrying capacity is not surpassed within a certain area. Thank you. Our next question is a two-part question. Uh, we've had several attacks by a possible koi wolf that is large, extremely aggressive, and being spotted around North Oshawa. And Leslie, could you comment on that? Sure. Thank you, Brenda. So again, I'll um, refer back to the presentation and looking at the scientific classification of our eastern coyotes. So um, there is some confusion there. Uh, we don't have koi wolves and eastern coyotes. Koi wolf is essentially a nickname 
um, that, you know, we don't have half coyote, half wolf, um, Eastern coyotes. They have uh, a, a small percentage of Algonquin wolf DNA, which is um, a species that um, inhabits around the Algonquin Park area. There are other habitats, Killarney and some places in Quebec. Uh, but no, we don't have uh, Eastern coyotes and coy wolves. And so um, oftentimes we do get reports and um, the identification of that animal is not correct. And so one thing to look for if you're not sure what you're looking at and some domestic dog species resemble coyotes and vice versa. We get calls of folks thinking it's a domestic dog when it's a coyote. And um, so you're looking at the tail. The tail will be down if that coyote is on the move. Um, and domestic dogs, their tails could be up in the air, straight out. And so, um, you know, we would need to use uh, photographic evidence. Um, that's why it's always great to provide that. Um, we rely heavily on morphology, and that's just a fancy name of how an animal looks. And so um, I think, um, and that also with that question, um, that's, you know, not referring to recent incidents. So I just, I want to be clear about that. These are um, historical incidents that occurred in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. The next part of the question is, is this animal going to be dealt with? And if so, when? And perhaps I could ask Kevin Fagan from Municipal Law Enforcement to comment. Um, again, in circumstances where uh, an animal is behaving aggressively, um, dealing with it in terms of elimination is, is in a last resort. So following um, appropriate investigation, uh, identification of the animal, and when all other measures have failed. Um, that would be the only time that we'd be considering um, from a public safety perspective, uh, the need to remove an animal. Okay, our next question. Would enforcing pets on leash laws be an asset to start forcing these laws? Um, and I'll ask Kevin to speak to the enforcement of, of that regulation. That's a great question. And certainly it's uh, something that we encourage all the time, compliance with our uh, responsible pet owners bylaw with regards to leashing pets and including both dogs and cats, not allowing them to roam at large. Um, whether it's a cat that would attract a coyote as a, a prey species that might feed on cats um, or dogs that can have negative reactions. Um, we're concerned not only about dogs from a public safety issue with interactions with other dogs and people, but uh, as we've indicated, they can have negative reactions or create negative behaviors with coyotes as well. So our officers do patrol parks and areas and um, would enforce responsible pet owners bylaw, issuing administrative monetary penalties for non-compliance if necessary. Thank you. Our next question, can Leslie give guidance to individuals who are feeding feral cats as far as keeping the cats safe? Oh, what a great question. Um, first of all, if, if the person is in the audience tonight, um, if you need further information, please do reach out. Um, we do have, um, you know, a networking of great um, colony caregivers um, across Southern Ontario. So first and foremost, uh, we suggest that you feed and remove. And I know that can be difficult, but depending on what the regulations are um, for the, you know, schedule for feeding um, the cats in the colony. So the feeding and removing is essential. Um, we have seen cases where um, an Eastern coyote that had a bum leg actually would wait his turn for the 13 cats to eat and they would move out of the way and the coyote would consume the rest of the cat food that was left out. So we don't want that. Um, 
there you just don't want to have those encounters but if there is um, excess food in the environment the coyotes will absolutely utilize that and it's not healthy food for them as well and it's also can be stressful for um, you know uh, the caregivers so if there is a situation that you are aware of where there's a coyote visiting there you can always um, reach out to us uh, you can send photographs, whatever it is, or video or for it, when we're in the community. Again, we can always come and do a visit there as well. Um, but there are, uh, you know, great ways and just, you know, ensuring as well that they have, um, the cats have their uh, secured places where they're um, sleeping and resting. I hope that helped. If the person's in the audience and they need more information, please let me know. I'd be more than uh, happy to assist. Thank you, Leslie. And that does lead into another question asking if we can share your contact information again, and we will do so at the end uh, on, a, on the following, uh, the last slide we have has all the contact information. Um, the next question is, how many complaints does an animal need to be considered aggressive? Uh, some people may panic and embellish a situation. So I would ask Kevin and municipal law enforcement to respond, please. Thank you. Again, a, a great question, and really it shouldn't be based on the number of complaints, but rather the uh, looking at the complexity of our uh, coyote response management plan. Um, so beginning with whether it be a sighting and uh, tracking and monitoring that information to distributing educational material to media uh, neighborhood, um, looking at what might be the attractants and, and why the frequency of sightings and the behavior um, may be as a result of. So reviewing garbage cans in the area to ensure they meet best practices for coyote deterrence, as well as investigating the, the area for evidence, um, removing any attractants, the installing of signage, securing the area with temporary fencing, um, perhaps even uh, temporary closing uh, a public area if there's a, a concern or risk, um, reducing naturalized growth, um, removing uh, the garbage containers in a specific area, engaging our community partners. Um, th that's really, you know, levels or progress as we go down through the, the coyote management plan rather than just basing it on um, the number of, of calls that we received and really finding out what's motivating that coyote's behavior or creating um, what might be considered uh, aggressive behavior when in fact it may be just natural behavior. So I think it, it's really important to focus on the plan and follow through those stages or steps to get a full uh, understanding of the circumstance and situation and not just immediately jumping to a, a situation where we feel that there, there's a, an actual public safety risk. Thank you, Kevin. And our next question is for you as well. Have you put a program in place to track coyotes so that if an attack takes place, the coyote can be located? Um, in terms of tagging or tracking coyotes, um, collaring coyotes requires significant expertise and it's very expensive to. Um, the city of Oshawa doesn't have that expertise that's required to do so. And the city has um, communicated or, or spoken with the ministry um, and, and they'll consider such work going forward if the need uh, is there and it's appropriate. Um, with regards to uh, uh, the other sort of process is, is our uh, categorization of uh, sightings and collecting that data and information to make the best or informed decisions going forward. Thank you, Kevin. Our next question is, have you considered an after hours number? Should there be a coyote attack or a sighting in a residential area? And I can advise that incidents can be reported through Service Oshawa 24-7 uh, following the voice prompts on the recording. If an officer is on duty, they will be dispatched to investigate wherever possible. In addition, if there's ever um, 
if there's a concern of imminent threat to your safety, uh, 911 can be called. Okay, that appears to be all the questions this evening. On behalf of the City of Oshawa, Coyote Watch Canada, and the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources, and Forestry, thank you for joining us this evening to learn more about coexisting with coyotes and asking your coyote-related questions. For more information about coyotes, please visit www.oshawa.ca slash coyotes. We also encourage you to take the e-learning module Coyotes in the Urban Landscape, which was developed by Coyote Watch Canada in conjunction with the City of Toronto, and it can be found on uh, CWC's website at www.coyotewatchcanada.com. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your evening.